Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you so much for tuning in for another lovely 90 minutes with Kawhi Riot uh, during Garnet Gateau. I am super excited to, with all of my lovely panelists to talk to you about self-care, sexuality, and acceptance. Finding joy is a radical act. Um, basically, I just hope to cover um, self-care uh, both within the community and in terms of our own personal journeys, uh, like our brushes with sexuality, uh, working on acceptance of ourself and of others. So I am just super excited to do this panel. I've been like waiting, like I thought it would be perfect for Garnet Gateau with our theme of love. So yeah, here we go. Um, I've got some quick disclaimers for everybody. The term queer will be used in a reclaimed manner. Um, I do say we're talking about sexuality, but it's gender identities, not the act of sex, so you're good. Um, and there are unfortunately going to be mentions of movements built around bigotry. I will give huge content warnings before that happens, and I even have it on a countdown, so you will be able to take a bit of a break and come back if this is something you don't want to hear about right now. Completely understandable. We want to make sure that you're tailoring your experience with us as best as you can. So on to the fun part, we're going to do our intros real fast. Uh, I'm Avina. I use they, them pronouns. These are my socials. People keep taking my name, so I have to keep changing it, so sorry. Um, I've been involved in alternative fashion for over half my life at this point. I've been quantifying it that way, and it's been freaking me out. <laughs> but uh, I've also been in Lolita fashion primarily for about 15 years, um, and I've worn a whole slew of other styles over that time. Um, I'll let my other panelists introduce themselves. Hey everyone, um, happy early Valentine's Day, I guess. <laughs> my name is Jade, I go by she, they pronouns. All my social media is Jaded Island. I've been in alternative fashion for a little over three years now. And I've been dressing in yummy kawaii, decora, and just general cuteness, because who doesn't love being excessively in pink? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shayla. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I am a aspiring Lolita and J fashion enthusiast. Um, I go by officially Shea Bear on IG. Okay. Um, my name's Nick. Um, I go by She Bay. Um, my Instagram is The Bad Wolf Ring. I've been in Lolita and J Fashion for couple years now. I've always been a little bit into alternative fashion since high school and still feel like a noob, but I've been pretty active in the community for at least the last four years. Hi everyone, my name is Kay. Um, I go by she, they pronouns. I have been doing J fashion since I was about 18 years old, but the fashion I started with is Lolita fashion. I still do it, not as much. Um, I cosplay and I also um, do kimonos and I also have done Yami Kawaii and Fairy K. Those are my top three. And also you guys are all in for a pun ishment today. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you're wondering why the pun counter did not start at zero, it's because we were already going totally wild backstage. You're, you're in for it. Be prepared with like either a glass of water or a glass of 21 plus Bev <laughs> and go to town. <laughs> We're sorry for your liver. <laughs> so I'm going to start off the first part of this with self care. Um, so Self-care uh, has changed a lot over the last few years. It's kind of turned uh, like into an advertising gimmick, um, but originally it had a, like 
very radical um, beginnings, and we wanted to kind of touch on the history of self-care, how we all engage in it, and suggestions to you for how to engage in it going forward. I just find it very important to take these moments to like reflect on yourself, uh, work on yourself, uh, just centering yourself, basically. Not to sound like I'm like super into yoga, but we've got a great piece um, that Sumiko of Kawaii Riot wrote called Kawaii Riot 101 Radical Self-Care. Uh, we've got someone dropping that link in the chat, hopefully. Feel free to keep that open, read it now if you feel like multitasking, whatever floats your boat, but it's a really great introduction to what self-care is. If you want it verbally, we're kind of gonna go into a lot of the points that Sumiko touches on in our next slide. Take it away, Jade. Yay, thank you. So let's talk about the history of self-care. So radical self-care, it might be surprising for you guys to know that the concept originated in the Black Panther movement. This is now widely a known practice started because the act of resting up and refueling helped to fight against oppressive capitalistic societies. So essentially taking care of yourself was just another way to, to fight back. Now, Audre Lorde um, was an American writer whose work was dedicated to addressing injustices as a queer Black femme. Being so heavily in the public eye, Audrey put emphasis on recentering herself in order to continue her work. As an activist, self-care was equally political due to society's endangerment of her existence. What we can learn from this is that self-care is equally as important as the work we do and how we protect ourselves. It takes me a second to unmute myself, so sorry. So <laughs> um, the primary goals uh, when you approach self-care, no matter what style of self-care you do, is you're trying to avoid distractions and focus on yourself. But big, big note, it looks different for everyone. Um, do you want to elaborate on that a bit more for us, Jade? Yeah, so obviously when we see self-care in media and in society, it tends to look very much yoga and cute mugs and just put in a bath bomb. And there's nothing wrong with doing those things, but like self-care really is an individual process. And so what is caring for you is going to look different than what I'm doing, what Avina's doing, what Shayla's doing, what Nick's is doing, what Kay's doing, whatever it is, you're developing it for yourself. So remember that self-care is a personal journey and it doesn't need to re reflect what we see in society today. Absolutely. And it's it's so tempting right now, especially like the beauty market has really been loving talking about how different steps in their beauty routine is a form of self care. Although for me, I am totally someone who does find a lot of like, uh, comfort in doing like a very like routine daily and nightly skincare regimen. This isn't for everyone completely understandable and it's also important to kind of take note of the times when it seems like a cosmetic company is sort of like hey want to practice some self-care here's a lipstick you'll only wear once like it it's it's very it's good to keep your mind open to the fact that unfortunately the term self-care has been appropriated for capitalistic gain and we're gonna have um shayla kind of run us through a little bit of that and we'll also talk about what we do to help unwind. Right, so uh, like you said, it was traditionally rooted in the yoga and meditation practices, but um, the more time you spend with yourself, the more you'll figure out what engages you. Um, for me personally, uh, playing music, listening to podcasts, um, I use Spotify, I pay for it, and it's totally worth it, no commercials. I listen to lots of different podcasts and just being able to listen helps me just kind of center myself. I also like creating lists. Um, I make a list of pretty much everything from a daily task, from things that I like, from movies that I want to watch. Um, anime is also a big opportunity for me to just something that I can enjoy by myself, regardless, uh, almost preferably by myself, watching anime, laughing, just taking in all of the animation or the story that's going in. Um, and sometimes just calling up a friend is not just so much waiting for them to reach out to you, but because you need time to feel appreciated and loved by just your friends or even loved ones um, as well. 
I really love the idea of um, calling up a friend, like, especially now, it's so hard to see your loved ones and have those moments with them. I know for one, I'm like, I've taken it for granted being able to just hug a friend. Um, so yeah, like a phone call, a video call, doing a panel with all these amazing panelists, like it's kind of been this like nice little form of self care. I'm able to catch up with everyone and it's been really nice. Um, go ahead, Kay. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to add on to the whole thing of um, calling friends, even simply just texting them is also a good practice to have because it shows that you care. And sometimes if you're introverted like me, I kind of, I'm like a turtle, I hide in my shell. So it's good to like leave a message. And if you don't feel like answering, don't answer. I mean, it takes a lot of emotional energy and honestly, COVID is like a drain. So definitely don't feel pressure to answer messages right away. It's not, it's not life or death. It's not shellfish if you don't feel like coming out of your shell. <laughs> and I think we all tested positive for missing the homies. <laughs> I can't, I really can't with these puns at all. <laughs> but these puns are puns. beautiful. <laughs> oh my God. But yes, puns is, is a way of self-care if you think about it. Um, if you guys in the chat want to talk about some of your personal self-care um, actions and activities, definitely do that. You might be able to inspire someone else to try something new for their personal routines. Um, do we want to talk about ours a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, so... For me, I really like cooking a meal. Um, I'm the sort of person who gets really caught up with work and before I know it, I've been sitting in front of my computer for 10 hours straight with no real breaks. So taking that time to you know collect the ingredients, maybe find a new recipe I wanna try out and just experiment in the kitchen has been like a great way for me to kind of unwind, focus on myself, maybe find something new that makes my mouth happy. That's always fun as well. Um, I also really enjoy taking long baths. I just moved and there's no bathtubs here. So I'm pretty sad about that. But that used to be like one of my favorite things to do. I'd light candles. I'd put my humidifier right by the bathtub. I would use all of my like extremely expensive bath bombs I was hoarding for way too long to just kind of create the wildest multicolor cocktail of bubbles while I just sit and unwind and enjoy all the nice smells. <laughs> so, Avina, so are you saying that you have a seafood diet? <laughs> Every time you see food, you eat... <laughs> no! Who's the door? <laughs> Genuinely, these puns. I'm glad that I'm not drinking because if I had to take a drink every time I heard a pun in this panel, I would be gone. I'd be, I'd be wasted. I'm drinking um, water, so this is how I'm hydrating. Or people can you know, do like little mini sips. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, drinking water is a very important uh, self care activity for me. Some of my self care things. Obviously, we all know I'm a book bookworm, book nerd. So writing and journaling are a big part of my self-care routines. Um, but outside of that, like Shayla, I do like watching anime. I love reading webtoons. And whenever I get a chance to like really organize and like restructure my day or my week. So planning out things really helps me feel like I'm getting my things together. Getting my life together is a form of self-care. So once I plan out my week or my month, creating my content calendars, whatever it may be, that gives me a lot of purpose, makes me feel a little bit better about like where my life is going. So that's my personal self-care. What about uh, you, Nix? Oh, okay. For me, um, I stress break a lot. Um... Well, that sounded bad a lot. Um, I also craft. I cosplay occasionally, and I um, I crochet a lot. Um, not well, but the I the rep re uh, the words repetition of crocheting keeps my mind on counting stitches and how many loops, and then. For me, that kind of just helps me de-stress because I'm focusing on something else. Um, and cosplay, when it's not stressful and you just like are in a project, kind of helps me like not focus on everything else around me. Just me, paint, and trying to make this look like an actual sword. So 
that's part of my self-care routine. And then books and stuff. So. The counting um, really resonates with me. I like to do a lot of hobbies that like make me focus on counting. Um, I play like a lot of Sudoku when I just need like some time to zone out. And I feel like that, that, that need to like count panels to count to like kind of do a little bit of like number elimination kind of keeps me busy in a way that I feel like crochet does in a, in a sense. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I mean, it, it does for me because I'm like, I'm not perfectionist when it comes to like my scarves and hats, but I kind of want it to be uniform in a way. So it's making sure I'm in count and I'm not like adding extra stitches, which makes things even more lumpy. It kind of helps me like calm my brain down and slow it down to a point where like I'm actually not focusing on the world, but just focusing on like what's right in front of me. Okay, what about you? Besides puns. Um, well, besides puns, I like to throw shade. I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, for me, I kind of like to get off of social media for at least like an hour a day where I kind of just toss my phone into the void and I'm just, yeet! Um, because sometimes I get a little sucked in and since I'm a political science um, person, um, it's a little easy to get sucked into like every single bad thing going on in the world and you're just like I'm sitting at my computer just rubbing my head like okay so I log off of all the social media and I blank out I draw and I just sort of relax into it and I listen to some of my favorite music like lately I've been listening to like Sonic Hero soundtrack um yes I am a geeky nerd as well so and I play video games um because it's very nice to have something that just sort of takes your mind out of the world, like Nick said, um, and repetition is good. Although, yeah, those are some of the things that I like to do as like a self-care act and also dance around my room like an idiot, just dabbing around. So I know I'm old, but yeah. <laughs> I, I listen to a lot of Sonic music as well. So when he said you turn on Sonic Heroes, I was like, oh, for me, it's a Sonic R. I, I love Sonic Racing's OST. Will, like, sing me, sing me to sleep. Like, it's just so, so fun. <laughs> I, I did want to touch real quick, too, on the second point to, like, avoid capitalistic instincts. I'm the sort of person who, like, sometimes i'm like i'm having a bad day i'm going to buy this purse and that's not necessarily the best way to deal with your stress or deal with the things going on in your life i definitely do not practice what i preach all the time when it comes to that but it is important to kind of take that with like, moment of pause like am i buying this purse because i actually think i'm going to like really use it and utilize it and it's like adding something new and refreshing to my wardrobe or am i buying it because I'm mad at something else right now, and I just want like that quick blast of serotonin. I can definitely relate to that. Um, I've made a lot of interesting Hello Kitty purchases over the past few years. There's been a lot of stressful things that happened between 2020 and 2021. So my my quick add to cart terrible self care is buying something that's Hello Kitty because Hello Kitty makes me feel happy, and that's my quick serotonin. But then I'm like that wasn't financially responsible. And so that's not actually taking care of myself. And then of course, if there's a new release for uh, one of my favorite brands, I am eyeing it under stress and definitely tempted to once again, add to cart. Shayla, I know you had a good point to say about this too. Yeah. So I was just gonna say, we all are, most of us know how difficult it is to not, uh, purposely just buy things. Um, I definitely been a victim of feeling like I needed to spend money on my looks or things like that because I was under the impression that that was something someone who loves themselves is supposed to do. Like it's it's definitely glorified as far as like buying yourself flowers, taking yourself out on a date. Those things are nice, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing you have to do, especially if you're not even financially stable enough to do that. Um, doing what's free is freeing. It's something that I read. Uh, 
just learning to like yourself, be comfortable with yourself, accepting that you like to dance around your own weird, like Kay said, um, or just being able to uh, talk with a friend or something like that. Well, that's what really should spark joy or be able to spark joy. Nixa, do you want to add anything? Um, I mean, like, I understand fully the whole, hey, I'm going to order me this thing, and then it's going to come in the mail, and it's like a present to myself. I'm a big, I blame Parks and Rec for this, the Treat Yourself episode, because it kind of sparked that whole, well, you know what, why shouldn't I treat myself today? So, but then I'm like thinking, as I've gotten older, that a treat doesn't always have to come from the store or like it's better to budget for a bigger treat so instead of like buying a whole bunch of small treats I'm like okay if I do something else like I have a gratitude journal now so weekly if I keep up with it putting in entries then at the end of the month I will treat myself to something worthwhile that matters and that I actually either need or something that I actually have been wanting for more than three months. That's my limit on wants. If it's been in my head for three months, then I'll get it. And that's part of my self-care and budgeting. I also wanted to make a quick point about how sometimes like being surrounded by the boxes of your purchases can almost like trigger that anxiety. And in the end, it's like this like, Ouroboros of just feels bad, man. <laughs> like, like it's just like, like, oh, like you're, you're buying stuff to try and make your Yeah, you're yeah. literally like, speaking to me like, right now because I don't know where the recycling room is in my new apartment, and these boxes are just they're just piled up. <laughs> oh no! I, I really yeah. like that uh, three month wait because. Uh, I was just going to say, it, it is kind of amazing how much the your mind can change. Like, from that insta-buy gratification to if you wait on it and you still want it, one, it may not be there, which is kind of for the best. If it's sold out, then you're just like, well, dang. But two, I mean, you may think, huh, I could wait. Or you checking your closet. You may have something similar that you you just didn't really need it. So I do think, like you said, next waiting is a really good idea. There's also another aspect of self-care that we should probably consider a little bit more, especially in the digital age, and that's online versions of self-care. Um, Kay, I think you had a really good point in our private meetings about this panel, about some good online self-care that people can practice. Indeed. I think one of the biggest things about online self-care, instead of just buying all those boxes to where you're just kind of boxing in, <laughs> um, the other thing is, is that not getting on to online fights, because nine times out of 10, you're totally not going to change that person's opinion about like whatever it is you're arguing about to the color of a dress, to big, huge ideologies, nine times out of 10, you're probably not likely. So it's kind of like trying to find a needle in a haystack. So in other words, instead of trying to bring a horse to water, just let the horse go, nay, I tried. <laughs> oh gosh, the pun counter. I wanted to re-bring up too that the social media break aspect of online self-care is so important. A lot of us are forced to create content to satisfy the social media demigods and it's exhausting. Like I, it's really, it's too much. And sometimes those spaces can be very negative or overwhelming. So taking a break from social media is honestly a blessing, whether it be for a couple of hours, just so you can get some work done or even from a day to a whole week. I don't know what uh, month it was where it took a week from social media and it was like the best week of my life. <laughs> I recently had to do that. I realized like I was looking at my Twitter and just getting so overwhelmed and I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna lock the account for a bit and I'm gonna walk away. So you don't have to sit there and worry about like someone new trying to contact me and being like, why didn't you apply? Because I locked up my account. It, it, it's, it's really nice to be able to like take that step back. Um, 
I know right now, especially social media loves to devalue you for not posting often, for not being everywhere at once. And it's really infuriating, but at the end of the day, like you come first. Um, the social media algorithm cannot and should like, cannot get in the way of that. Um, I understand that that's like, especially hard. Um, especially if you have like a business that's linked to social media, it can get difficult. And sometimes it's okay to just kind of check out, even if you can't afford to do like a whole week, like even if it's just like, you know what, I'm going to treat this like a day job. I'm in social media nine to five and then I'm out. Like no checking DMs, no like, like doom scrolling, nothing. Go ahead, Kay. So one of the self-care things, I, I'm also scrolling through the comments. I think Neo Rococo memes made a good point um, to do Google Earth randomizer. I've never heard of doing that before, and now I totally want to try it. I think that's a good self form of self-care and a good way of escapism. So I, I agree with that. That sounds like so much fun. I'm, I'm going to try and give that a shot. <laughs> Did anyone else have any other um, self-care things before we get into the next topic? I think we're good. We had a, a lot of good uh, suggestions in the comments as well. Um, there were a few that I think should be written down somewhere. It'll, it'll be lost on Twitch uh, probably after this panel, but I'll remember them and I'll write them down a little bit later. I think my favorite was planning a cord as a method of self-care. Oh yeah, I can I can second that. Sometimes I just sit down and like make a collage of my outfit. So here's where we're gonna talk about our journeys, both with like our sexual identities, um, just our queerness in general. Uh, I I don't want to touch on this without also talking about how important it is to have an intersectional queer community. Um, Sumiko, once again writes this really incredible, um, what's the word? The definition, there we go, for intersectionality. Um, it's the cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination combine in the experiences of marginalized people. I wanted to take this opportunity to just kind of have all of us sort of have a little like laid back conversation about, you know, our walks through the space and how it's defined or changed our lives accordingly. Um, for me, I only somewhat recently kind of realized that, oh, I'm non-binary, and that took a long, like, a lot of soul searching. I was not sure where I fell on the, like, the gender spectrum, because it's not a binary, and I, I just, I, I didn't know where I fell. I didn't feel like I was, I guess, your typical, like, typically masculine, typically feminine. I just, nothing felt quite right, and then I started experimenting with changing my pronouns around um, especially with like my close loved ones. And it gave me so much euphoria. <laughs> it made me realize like, oh wow, there's so much vocabulary here I'd skimmed over. Um, realizing that I was non-binary kind of like helped me um, find a new community for one thing um, and be able to articulate the unique ways I could be hurt or wanted to be loved. Um, so yeah, like that. that's kind of how I sort of um, transformed over my time um, in the queer community. I honestly, I just, I call myself queer. I'm not straight. It's like easiest to describe my sexuality that way. Um, so I've always kind of been in the fringes of the community, um, but had a hard time finding people who like had first generation American experiences or Indian experiences in the community. So being able to focus on that intersection between all of these identities of mine um, has been very freeing. Um, but yeah, I'll let everyone else kind of share their thoughts. Well, I'll jump in and so for friends that know me personally, I always tell them when it comes to like my faith and things like that, that I'm a retired Christian. And that kind of ties in with my personal journey with being queer. So being black and queer, it's, it's complex is the simplest way to put it. Um, being there's a lot of homophobia in the black community, unfortunately, and then even in the queer community, there's also a lot of racism. So combating both those battles has been very difficult, and it's it's a struggle to to put it lightly. It took a really long time for me to understand and accept myself and my sexuality, 
And I'm still like working through it, working through how I personally identify. For now, my identification is just black and femme because I'm queer and I'm trying to accept myself every day. And it's something that I'm voicing as much as I can to reaffirm myself and also a part of my personal self-care and process of acceptance. There, it just, it takes a lot of time. And I, I'm glad that I've gotten to the point where I am surrounded by people who accept me for who I am and having friends that support me every step of the way, my partner, like it's, it's really nice and it's comforting, even though there are still issues that need to be addressed for both communities being black and queer. And hopefully over time, I'll feel more comfortable and more safe to do so. But for now, I'm just here, a pink pansexual menace out here in the wild, making pots and pan uh, jokes on the, on the internet and sharing my memes on a regular basis. But that's me, that's my journey. Um, as always, I try to be as welcoming and brave myself, but it takes a lot of courage and finding that every day has been, it's been difficult, but I'm, I'm working through it, guys. I'm working through it. <laughs> I think right now, like the way a lot of like queer culture is kind of defined, and let's be real, like mainstream queer culture is like overbearing, overbearingly white. Um, there's like this talk about like, you know, you're born with the knowledge, the innate knowledge of like what you are. And I think the reality is, especially when you do have these intersecting ideologies and like these different cultures that you have to like combat, like I know the homophobia runs rampant, rampant in like the South Asian community as well. Um, it's it it's hard to like feel like oh I, I just woke up and like I knew that this is what was going on with me um and I, I think when we talk about intersectional experiences we also see that evolution that like slow growth and realization of what we are as we learn like new vocabulary and new ways to talk about our experiences um and I think that's why it's so important to like make sure that the queer community like becomes more and more intersectional and more diverse because like right now the dominant narrative is very much like i was born this way i woke up this way this is it this is the only way you can experience your queer identity but that's so inaccurate and i think for me seeing it in real time i had the the blessing to go to dc's pride and also baltimore pride and I loved that experience, but then I also equally, I think, hated it because the white queer community in that space was very, very not welcoming in general. And it was very like disheartening to come into the space thinking that I'm gonna celebrate who I am with people who should understand that same struggle, but then they're looking at you with disdain, side-eyeing you because I'm I'm black and I'm queer. And it's, it's a lot, but I'm happy that I went to those uh, spaces and that I got to be with my friends in those areas and see things in real time, like to experience it in person. Cause I needed to know, I needed to know what the reality was. And hopefully going forward, we see more intersectionality in the queer community, but for now we're here at this panel. So one step forward, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And also like there's tokenism that like runs rampant. Like, you know, I, I'm so used to like walking into a space for the LGBT community and I'm the one South Asian. Um, so all of a sudden you're like fielding these like really awkward questions about your family life, about the food you eat, about your hair. And I'm just like, oh, I, I just came here to like meet people who like everybody, like me. Like I, I did not come here to like talk to you about curry recipes. Like this is just so, <laughs> like what are you doing? Uh, yeah, if I can understand that, Avina. Um, I think, uh, like Jade said, it, it is still just one step at a time. Um, I'm going to say not too long ago, the colors, purple, black, gray, and white, they didn't really mean anything to me. Neither did any flag for that, uh, for that matter. But um, upon learning more about like dem demisexuality, um, that was something that I identified with uh, more than a lot of the other ones. Um, it's still very new to me, uh, but I definitely feeling like because of my friends in the community that everyone is just so accepting of it. Um, and it's just, it's very helpful to know that there are communities like out there. Uh, and then also that 
there isn't just like a binary because it, it is very confusing growing up and just never hearing anything and those things also just not even being an option for most of us so just being able to say this now is just is very freeing and uh you know age it doesn't matter i'm uh turning 30 this year so you know it's it's definitely just everyone's own individual story yeah, it resonates a lot. I'm, I'm also turning 30 this year. So it's like, I, I feel like a lot of my friends who do identify as non-binary, they definitely kind of are much younger than me, um, like in their early 20s and their mid 20s. And I'm just, I'm so happy for them. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I would have loved to have been someone who knew Absolutely. what non -big. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh, like, I, I'm just so happy for them. Um, but there is also this kind of feeling of like, did, did I come into this late? And that's like, that's not true at all. Like, you know, everyone has their own journey. Everyone discovers uh, when something like really resonates with them. For me, it was like finding a specific like written piece that like just like set off that light bulb in my mind of like, wow, I feel this. Like I, re like, I so deeply empathize with like everything they're talking about. I guess like maybe this is something I should think about and experiment with and see if it gives me joy. I just want you guys to know there's a lot of support for being 30 and queer in the chat. And that is just honestly really beautiful and really nice to see. So thank you guys in the chat for being so supportive of being queer at no matter what age you are. I want to say Thanks to people in the chat that are being supportive because I think I'm the old one of the oldest at 30 plus. We're just gonna say 30 plus um on my journey. Um when I started it kind of was like I knew I was bi, but then also I grew up in a black house, black Christian house, Caribbean household, and Latina household where it's kind of like what? And then also, I am very tall, so I kind of either got more of tomboyish looks, and then at least through the community, I found being, I'm definitely more on the femme side of everything, um, and even being able to incorporate that with golf looks and not have it be so masculine sometimes helped me. And then even as growing up, I know I told my parents I was bi, and they were like, no. But as I've grown up and gotten more involved in communities that have been supportive, most of my family is supportive, and most of them just see that they're just happy that I'm now this very colorful, bright person. And I owe that to a lot of the support in the community, um, both queer and J fashion because I never would have thought to step out of like my fashion box, which helped me step out of my sexuality box. And even though I was a late bloomer, I def and I'm so always learning. So thanks to the, the younger crowd um, teaching me about like, cause I always thought bisexuality was it, but then I learned about pansexuality and how our community is always evolving. like that is a beautiful part of the community. And I hope like with even this panel, how we become more intersexual, intersectional, and then also hopefully that translates over to media because I would like to see some nice representation of people of color that are queer, that are doing normal stuff and not being like background friend number five. Or a tragedy, I'm seconding that. Yeah, like I really would just love to see a nice love story, you know, or like even an action movie. Just like we we have full lives. I would like to see them on screen, but I am your normal, well not not very normal, but I'm your bisexual older auntie that will fight anyone who bullies you. Thinking about like my dream queer film would be like Lord of the Rings, but like extra gay. 
and at, like with so much more like I would love gender it. spectrum representation. Like yes, please. Oh my god, can can I be casted? Can I write for the show? Actually, I would love to write that. Actually, oh my god, I'm so excited. <laughs> I just have a wardrobe for that because. Yeah. All right, listen, unofficially, this is now the planning for the queer Lord of the Rings, and everyone here is a part of the directing team in the cast. Makeup? Makeup? Yes. <laughs> Are you just trying to ring everyone up so we can all have a huge cast without having to search? <laughs> ring everyone up. Okay. I just. Bless everyone. I just want to be the one to de to like to deliver the end of my axe line like that. That's all I ask for. <laughs> Let me be the dwarf. <laughs> like like, I saw the sexuality uh like weapons. Now I want to buy axe. Oh my gosh! Yes, I remember that. I for there was a really good. There was another very good pun. Uh, in that, like, it was a Kickstarter, right? So, to yeah. give some more context for folks in the chat, it was this Kickstarter of enamel pins, um, where they assigned, like, really badass weapons to all types of, like, gender identities and sexualities, and it was so good. <laughs> I want one. Like, the actual weapon, not the pin, just the weapon. Yes, we want the, we want the actual weapon. Go ahead, Kay. Okay. Um, I sorry. I my my mind stopped. <laughs> okay. Um, thinking about awesome weaponry aside, um, sexuality for me is has been something that's always been suppressed. As um, Jade has said, I am definitely a retired Christian. Where. Um, I, at this age, I'm definitely, as 25, I'm definitely expected to have, like, kids in, like, a house and, you know, that standard American dream um, doesn't work for me. Um, I learned eventually to accept that I kind of, I like people, but I don't, I don't know, I'm very, it, sexuality is kind of hard for me. I, I do believe I'm under the pride flag of asexual or demisexual but like um it's I'm still trying to figure it out as you can tell um generally I kind of I'm kind of fluid with my gender and how I choose to present myself depending on who I'm around so in other words I do a lot of code switching um especially since I went to a, um, a high hoity-toity university um and I was around professors and spaces that were primarily dominated by men um not always white sometimes it was South Asians that did dominate the space. And um, I would usually dress a little bit more masculine sometimes just to kind of see if I could put power play. Um, it worked sometimes, it didn't. Um, but like I said, I, I'm, but at my school, I was generally kind of like the only black person in the room. And what made it complicated is that I'm Japanese and black. So you can imagine that people were trying to pigeonhole me when they couldn't. So, um, you know, and of course, there were definitely people who kind of um, were like, so you don't do certain things, or you don't have certain attributes that quote unquote add to my sexuality, like the whole thing of like black women having assets. And I'm just like, that's not what a black woman is supposed to be. But okay, that's, I don't know, sexuality is kind of hard for me. I'm sorry. I feel like that was a hidden pun. We've hit the double digits, y'all. <laughs> Is anyone legitimately drunk? <laughs> I feel extremely hydrated, so I think it's working. The caffeine is definitely kicking in for me. <laughs> I also just really wanted to tell y'all that, like, it means so much to me that we're all having this conversation right now it is so unbelievably hard to like hash out all of the all of the, the the culmination of all of our experiences and how it like shows in like our sexual identity and our queer identity it's just i i just we're, we're so freaking brave and i just want to thank you all for sharing your stories for providing the support 
for kind of creating this found family that I think is just so important. Honestly, it is a really big blessing to have a community like ours. And I'm hoping that as more people like get to know us and see what we're doing, that they feel just as welcome in our community and in our spaces. And, and I do think it's important to showcase like this evolution because um, I, yeah, like, I don't think we get to see it too often. We, I, we see the butterfly like fully formed out of the cocoon and we don't see that sort of like mush in the cocoon <laughs> that has to happen first. Oh, I just saw a comment that I actually quickly wanted to pull up. Hannah Amos, I, I know I butchered that, I'm so sorry. So this is an aspect of being queer that I actually think, I'm just gonna touch upon it briefly. I won't go too much into it, but being read as queer um, it's definitely something that people of color definitely get a lot of issue with. So like I can walk into a space and no one's gonna be like, oh, there she goes, the pan girl. No matter how like rainbowed out I am, like I have to prove that I'm queer all the time. And that's really annoying and frustrating. And when it comes to like being white and queer, you don't really have to prove it. They're just like, oh, we know that this person's queer. But then for me, I have to come into a space and I have to officially like, I feel like I have to come out the closet every five seconds to say that, yes, I am queer. And it's definitely something that should be unpacked a little bit more and maybe in another like space, maybe I'll do like a quick article about it, but that's a really good point. And thank you for sharing that in the comments. I've also like had this turn into a weird microaggression before where like I was wearing like a bunch of rainbow and someone was all like, oh, like, you know, you Indians just you love your color. And I'm just like, <laughs> It's June. <laughs> like, there's literally a pride parade happening, like, right outside. Like, really? <laughs> oh, God. It just gets worse and worse. <laughs> I'm just like, uh. it's, it's weird, like, how people just assume, like, oh, you're wearing that because of some other reason. Because you're brown, kind of? It, it's so weird. I, like, so much, like, odd stuff has happened. <laughs> Like, either from people, like, outside or inside the queer community, it, it's just very interesting. I, um, I accidentally attended the New York Pride Parade, um, and I, that was actually, like, I want to say it was one of the first times I saw, like, other South Asian queer people in the flesh. Like, I, I'd seen many online. I, I, like, I love a lock lemon, a lock lemon. I'm probably, like, butchering their, um, their Instagram handle. But like, there's like plenty of like queer folks online that I can look at, but you know, they live in Canada or they're just extremely far removed from me or they have like hundreds of thousands of followers and will not read my DM, which is like totally understandable. Um, so it was like really liberating to just see like so many queer South Asians in one place because like up until that point, I was just so used to being the token. I also wanted to recommend um, a great piece that was written by Cora um, called Asexualization, How My Kawaii Fashion Rejects Compulsory Sexuality. Uh, hopefully there's gonna be a link dropped in the chat. Again, feel free to read that uh, when you get the chance. I just really love what they have to say about how Kawaii Fashion helped them reject um, the sort of like over-sexualized mainstream image for a femme. Um, and they found this other aspect of themselves that I just find really, like, I just found this to be like a perfect read, like all the way through, highly recommend. And this is uh, where I kind of <laughs> will go on for a while. Um, acceptance versus tolerance. Uh, I parse words when it comes to acceptance versus tolerance because I, I believe acceptance is like active, empathetic understanding of a person's unique experience, whereas tolerance is more passive. You're kind of ho-humming, I guess I'm just gonna deal with this person now. Um, it's not active learning, it's not this active attempt to understand and empathize what a person is going through. Um, so I'd like to focus a lot on being accepting versus being tolerant going forward. Um, and for me that looks Oops. that looks like this, um, ensuring that there's a space, an opportunity for people to share their experiences, listening to those experiences, creating a community driven by shared lessons and 
most important acceptance of yourself. It's kind of like the like one of those RuPaul quotes are like, oh, you can't love anybody else until you love yourself. And I feel like acceptance is definitely uh, one of those things that you can kind of substitute for love because it, it when you've learned how to accept yourself, um, it's so much easier to pay that acceptance forward to others. Is this, is this me? Whoops. I missed my cue. Like Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I missed my cue. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to re um, reconnect back to acceptance of self. Um, it doesn't have to be something that's immediate or right away. It can be something that is practiced and something that you have to do like a little by little each day as you go on. For me, a personal model of life is that I take each day at a time because I don't have the luxury of having a life that is just like, I'm just gonna love myself 100% all the time. Cause like things happen and I have those high and low days. And for me, personal acceptance looks like just doing little bits whenever I can, as much as I can, when I have the energy to do so. But also being in a community where you are accepted is just as important. I wanted to, I think, briefly touch upon parasocial relationships as well here, if I remember correctly. Yeah, okay. So with parasocial relationships, like obviously when we're in these online spaces, we are engaging with people's lives to the point that like, we feel like we're a part of it, but we're kind of not, we're like adjacent to it. And another way of finding your own personal acceptance is like what you choose to accept in your life, even on a digital space. So if you're accepting that someone is like, completely homophobic, for instance, and like, that's not good for you. That's not a reflection of you accepting yourself if you're allowing that content and that energy into your space. That's not accepting yourself. That's you're tolerating yourself in a way, I guess. So going forward, I think that how we practice acceptance is not just what we're doing in real time, but also in the digital space as well. Avina, did you have anything else to add for that? No, I, I loved all of that. <laughs> like, I'm just like, yes. I'm not, like I'm not trying to like put myself like at the podium here, but like the journey of acceptance has been very important to me because there are so many barriers that we can experience as people of color, and even in the alternative fashion community, like we're already experiencing these barriers. People aren't going to accept our fashion, our lifestyle, and so how we choose to accept one another is very important for this community, and you know, inclusivity going forward. All right, I'm done on my I'm done on my podium now. I'll, I'll go back to my corner. <laughs> no, never. I I love your podium. I will put your podium a little bit higher. I will. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm five feet, but like you don't gotta put it too high. <laughs> <laughs> Just four inches, so you're my height. I would love to be four inches taller. That's for sure. <laughs> Honestly, accepting my height is still something that I struggle with. That's an example. I, I've yet to accept the fact that I'm only five feet. I present very tall energy. So <laughs> it's it's a delusion for myself, honestly. <laughs> we, we had a very important question. Does this count as a pun? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Did no. I just put a pun out here? I was not trying to do any pun. Was this an accidental pun? <laughs> It was. It still it counts was. as a pun. It's still a pun. Oh gosh, I, I failed, guys. I released a pun out into the world. <laughs> I guess you can say you're not coming up short this time. Oh my god! You know, I'm going it back wasn't to the corner. Wasn't intentional. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I hate to like leave this pun space because I'm about to give y'all a content warning. I am so sorry. <laughs> but um, we're, there, there is gonna be some Nazi imagery on the next slide. It's because I found a really good comic about the paradox of tolerance that I thought we should touch upon. Um, I'm gonna give everyone a warning. My plan is to stay on this next slide for exactly 10 minutes and move on. At that point, we all know to like stop talking about it or to just talk about the sort of the same kind of general issue in broad terms. So yeah, I'm, I'm literally waiting for like the live timer to hit a point where it's easy for me to remember the 10 minute mark. Um, go ahead, get a drink of water, come back in 10 minutes, we'll be done. So here we go. So I have um, told someone to drop a link to this comic because I do understand it's kind of hard to read. So hopefully y'all can pull it up if you're interested in hearing more about it. It's about the paradox of tolerance by the philosopher Karl, Karl Popper. And what he touches upon is the fact that 
when you tolerate intolerance, you're actually giving it a place to thrive. Um, giving intolerant ideologies gives them a place to have like wider access to an audience and create a dangerous foothold in any community that you can think of. Um, a really great analogy I like to think about is the story of the bartender who kind of kicks out a random patron kind of like randomly with like no real, um, what's the word, no real provocation. And everyone asks, why did you kick that guy out? He seemed pretty nice, he was pretty chill. The bartender replies, well, the guy's a Nazi and I don't want him to tell his other Nazi friends that we're a cool bar because then our bar is gonna turn into the Nazi bar and you're not gonna feel welcome here anymore because it's just gonna get overrun with this guy's Nazi friends. So you can really take this um, like idea and go running with it. You can you can think about it in any community. You can think about it at, like with a store. Um, like the, the moment you allow one person with extremely intolerant ideologies in, and you keep trying to give them birth and you keep trying to give them a chance to talk about this stuff, you are not only giving like giving them the confidence to continue to believe this sort of thing and like bring their friends into your space, but you're also going to be pushing out people who aren't comfortable with this. Um, so this is why deplatforming works, and I definitely want all of us to kind of talk about that a bit more. Yeah, deplatforming is isn't a restriction of speech, by the way. Um, the political scientist in me is absolutely screaming about like recent events. Whoops! Accidentally, did I wait? Was I not supposed to go? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. I accidentally muted myself. Whoops. Um, but yeah, so for it's not um, how deplatforming is. It's just mainly taking away social media, so you don't spread more dangerous ideologies. Because social media is basically kind of like being at a bar or classroom, because you know everyone can see it. It's there, and it definitely allows a place for something like Nazism to fester, which is not a good thing. Um, and First Amendment rights is much more tied to way before social media and just like freedom to say whatever you want. Like nowadays you can definitely say whatever you want online for the most part without ma many repercussions, but definitely intolerant messages hopefully aren't ones that people are spreading around. Um, they suck, basically. I wanted to add in that like social media definitely is a privilege. And I think you had brought this uh, point up um, maybe in our, in our private meetings, as I say. <laughs> Um, and deplatforming really does work. We don't have to continue to give these people platform, no matter how large their numbers are. We can one unfollow is still one unfollow. Like you're not giving them any more room to be present in your life, to be present in these spaces. You're, um, I'm, I don't want to say encouraging the algorithm because f the algorithm, guys. Um, when we unfollow and like stop interacting with their content, they're slowly getting into a smaller, smaller bubble. And then that bubble will be so far away that we don't have to even deal with it anymore. They can, they can be gone. They can deal with their horrible intolerance somewhere else. And we don't have to be there. And we can create our own little oasis of beautiful inclusivity somewhere else, be dressed to the nines, and it'll be a beautiful paradise. Who's with me? I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not ready to buy an island yet, but like, you know, eventually. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to stress how important it is that we reduce their reach because I, I don't think what, what people realize when they're sitting here trying to justify um, the actions of someone who has spouted this like ignorant ideology with no interest in changing their mind or learning. Um, like, I mean, know what you're getting into before you decide to like turn this into a teaching experience. Like. Kay mentioned this before, nine out of 10 times, you're not going to change someone's mind. Sometimes it's best to just be like, you know what, forget it and walk away. But it is, uh, <laughs> it is important to like, just kind of uh, know when it's time to sort of cut ties. Um, the more excuses you make for someone, um, the more birth you give them, the more likely it is that they're just going to kind of double down. I just wanted to shout out the pun um, that's a homage to my handle and brand name, uh, Jaded Island. Someone said that that's what I'm getting ready to create. And you're right, it would be a Jaded Island and we wear pink on my island. So there is that. <laughs> Can I get an honorary lavender license? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. We do all the colors on my island. Um, so yeah. 
we actually did. Is there anything else anyone else wants to add? Because we're still under time for the time I've allotted for this slide. So I think it's I, I think a form of self care. Oh, actually, yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. yeah, that is. Um, because, like, you, some of you guys have said that it's kind of like you're letting this negativity in. And I think since we're talking about self care, like, deplatforming them really does help and it kind of also doesn't have that negative headspace or that anxiety of hearing someone say something horrible about a group of people or yourself that you care about and if you love yourself then you kind of want to not have that in your space i feel like defollowing certain certain facebook pages and stuff like keeping your social media space and just on social media so much kind of in a like a space that you actually want to visit so you don't feel so anxious when you do, that's a good first step in deplatforming. Helps with that. And I also want to like Thank circle you. back to acceptance versus tolerance as well. Um, someone who accepts Nazi ideology is a Nazi, but someone who tolerates it is aiding them. Um, so like, you don't need to tolerate everything. It is totally fine to just be like, this is it. This is my, this is where I draw the line. I can't. <laughs> um, I think Itakai, I'm sorry if I pronounced your screen name wrong, but I do think you're right that liberal racism, we can deplatform. I think that that's a valid point that there are, I think this also gets to one of the articles and this also does feed into self-love about like people who kind of just hop into movements and they're not really there for the movement, but they're for like the clout. Um, that's like a huge clout chaser and like supremely toxic thing. Um, I think that it's important that we acknowledge that these things exist and try not to ignore it. Um, even though I won't lie, sometimes I kind of wish these things didn't exist and we didn't have to deal with it. But in order for things to get better, you have to face your problems head on. And there's no problem with taking a break. I, I wanna stress this a lot, even though all of us together or not, I don't know. Um, I think it's truly important if, if you're a part of any social movement for the better, you know, whether it be for LGBTQ, Black Lives Matter, any social movement, I think it's good that you take a break because it takes a lot of emotional energy to even be in such things. And to sometimes you're, you're just existing, like being non-binary, like Avina or like Jade, she's black and queer and like, um, Moss Badger, I mean, not Moss Badger, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting names wrong, Nyx and Bear, um, it's it's all extremely exhausting. So definitely learn to rest and not to quit. I think that's also a huge thing about self-care that we, we think we have to keep going, 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 going. No, you don't have to do that. I think it's definitely important that you do that. And self-care for everyone looks very, very different. So like mine and Jade's self-care is very different. She doesn't practice puns like I do. Um, <laughs> she doesn't dance around the room. She may, but um, it's very different. Oh, I, and I dance, but very poorly. <laughs> I do too. But yeah, I think it's definitely important um, for everyone to take a break, especially from social media sometimes, because in 2021, things be getting wild. I'm also backing up the, the concept that like taking a break from activism in itself is like still continuing to be an activist. Like remember, radical self-care, it originates from activist groups like the Black Panther uh, movement uh, group. And so when you are taking care of yourself, you're allowing yourself to continue that fight another day. And that's really important. Something that I really want to drive home in this panel that like taking care of yourself is a part of being an advocate. You can't continue fighting if you're like a uh, ghost emoji out on, on the floor somewhere and dehydrated. Like you have to be there and be present for yourself in order to be present for the world and the issues that you care about. Yeah, I think it's just really Im important to realize that we all kind of have our different thresholds and like the hope is that like the powers that be want activists to run ragged. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on from this side. Uh, we will continue the like this discussion, but in broader terms. Um, speaking of, <laughs> I just wrote a piece for Kawhi Riot not too long ago called Surviving the Right. Um, it's about my experiences with dealing with the darker corners of the internet and this need to assimilate um, into groups that were not tolerant, were honestly hateful, 
um, because I didn't think I had a more accepting support system that I could reach out to instead. Um, I just want to emphasize how important it is to know that these are journeys. You don't come out of the womb perfect with like all of the vocabulary you need. Um, so, you know, just just know that this is an like ongoing transformation. Like you're you're working on yourself every step of the way. Uh, it like not to like sound cliched. I honestly I really have like hate this movement. So I hate that I'm like half quoting it. But it it you can do better. It does get better. But you have to actively put in that work. Um, and I think a lot of people just kind of think that it's easy to unlearn like racism. It's easy to unlearn anti-blackness. It, it, it's not, it takes a lot of soul searching. It takes a lot of just realizing exactly what you need and to take breaks as well. Cause sometimes you've kind of ra like rattled your mind up with all kinds of guilt and that's also not helpful. <laughs> so, you know, ev everybody's journey looks different and hopefully this piece kind of helps shed light on that a little bit. So, oh my gosh, Q and A time. <laughs> we, are, we made it here much faster than I expected. <laughs> uh, I am just well, like, again, very glad um, that we were able to have this conversation. Feel free to ask us questions. Um, we'll try to respond to them as best as we can. Yeah, um, I do want to preface that we do want to focus on questions that are relevant to this panel and not the recent drama that happened. So please keep that in mind when you are asking questions. And of course, this is a brave space. So you are welcome to ask us whatever you can. And we will do our best. And if you have questions more about our, our platform or to us individually, please feel free to do so. Just keep in mind that you do want to be respectful, have a little more empathy with our questions. I think that's the best uh, moderator thing that I could say right now. <laughs> so, all right, we are ready for questions. So shoot them at us. Otherwise, um, Kay will keep coming up with puns and I don't have any more coffee. So please. So in other please words, you're up. just trying to send them all to the punitentiary? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're at 15, wow. It's me, Empress Graceful. I am so sorry, but yes, I am entirely responsible for the pun plague. Um, in Kauai, right, I'm also um, known as Professor Puns, so. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I did see a question from Neo Rococo Memes. Oh, that's a tough uh, handle, by the way. Um, they asked, um, what's something that each of us are looking forward to? Um, we'll start with our fearless leader of this panel, Avina, what's something that you're looking forward to? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I have not done any of the like online social events uh, Bay Area K hosts on Sundays, um, usually because I'm like extremely overwhelmed, but I just moved um, to a place that I don't have like a huge support system. So I'm super excited to actually be tuning into the social mixer tomorrow. That's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, I can't wait to put together a nice comfy outfit um, and just talk to people and maybe play Jackbox for the first time. I'm very excited. <laughs> what about you, Shay? You gotta unmute, love. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was just saying I had to think, like this is just in general, huh? Uh, <laughs> um, one thing I'm looking forward to is at the end of this month marks a uh, one year anniversary with my uh, current partner um we it doesn't feel like it and it's not necessarily the anniversary of us starting to date but we met at a movie theater i went to go see uh my hero academia in the in the theaters by myself and he was there and we met and things just went forward from then so i'm just really excited to just kind of relive that moment again and it's just been a really wild ride and i'm honestly more excited than i thought i would be so that's that's what i'm looking for not you having the cutest anime love story i've ever heard plus ultra yeah i really would how about you dix do you have anything that you're looking forward to 
well, my mom's birthday is on Monday. Um, and about looking forward to, um, so I did my self, my three month self treat thing. And I have been thinking about these skates for like six months and I ordered them. And hopefully they ship soon so that I can get them. Yeah, like I, I got them. Yeah. I, I, and like I, they have after pay and stuff. So I'm just like, okay, it's been like six months. I really want these skates. And they have the little moon on it. And I love moons. And my boyfriend, my partner was like, yeah, get it. Just, just, just stop talking about it. It's been like six months. She's been wanting these skates. And they have them in black and they're in stock. Just buy them. So I bought them. So now I know exactly which like skates Scott. you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be sitting in front of the door like Scott Pilgrim, just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll tackle the mailman. You'll see me on the news. It's fine. <laughs> you need to. Tell I look me forward to that headline. <laughs> <laughs> really tall black girl tackles mailman. Yeah, that, <laughs> that'll be me. My bad. <laughs> what about you, Kay? Do you have anything you're looking forward to? Um, getting destroyed by the foreign service officer. <laughs> Kidding. Um, but that is probably one of the huge things that I'm worried about for this year. Um, it's that and like getting my answers back from um, the schools I applied to. Um, so there's that. And tea. I love my morning tea and staring at the sunlight when it comes out at like 6 a.m. So I have very weird... Um, things that I look forward to. But yes, I'm looking forward to being obliterated. So this is how I pay for my sin of all the puns I've told. So <laughs> the universe answers. Oh my goodness. Um, for me, I'm really excited, guys, because I'm doing the thing and I'm getting ready to release two poetry chat books. And so this will be my first time publishing. And I'm so nervous because poetry is like very intimate and I'm very vulnerable in that space, especially because I'm talking about like grief and sexuality and like just being in a transitional age. And so I'm very nervous about like putting that stuff out into the world, but then I'm doing it and I'm like, wow, that's really exciting and so scary. Like I'm super, super scared to put my stuff out there like that, but I'm doing it. I'm doing the thing. <laughs> Also, I saw that we got two more questions. Let me scroll back up. Um, uh, let me see. How do you learn to accept yourself and be nice to yourself? Oh my goodness, can I start or does someone else wanna get, get to it before me? Me, 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 okay, okay, okay. All right, so once again, rule number one, take each day at a time. One of the things that I saw, I think a very long time ago is that you have to get into like a habit of just liking something about yourself, whether it be something like really small. Um, I've gotten to the point personally where I don't really like how my eyes look and I have like a really weird combo with my voice and things like that. And I get into a practice or a routine of being like, you know what, today my eyes do look nice. And once you get that habit going, that's like one step towards personal acceptance, whether it be something physically or emotional, mentally, you gotta take it one day at a time and whatever you start with, just keep building up upon that. And once you start saying it out loud or practicing it, it'll it'll come naturally over time. It's not gonna be, I'm not saying that you can speed run personal acceptance, but like once you start doing it, it does add up. Does anyone else wanna add on to how they personally accept themselves or be kind to themselves? Oh, Shayla, I see you. Yeah, okay. I definitely kind of wanted to piggyback off of uh what you said about saying it. So one of my biggest things that I have to work on and still working on and needed to work on is speaking up or hearing myself, not be afraid to use my voice, whether it's to just share a thought or to just use it because everyone else is using their voice. Um, so hearing the things you need to like about yourself is important, meaning, you write it down, you need to express it. Just having the sense of being able to express yourself, I guess for me, it was my voice, but with, with any, uh, how you do it is, is up to you, but writing it out, but definitely I think speaking it is the same as like casting a spell basically. So just hearing it over and over that repetition day by day is something that's helped me a lot. 
Does anyone else want to add on to how like they treat themselves kindly? Because that is a really big, important part of self-care is how we treat ourselves. Go ahead, Nix. Okay. Um, for me, like how Shea Bear said that like writing it out really helps. Um, gratitude. Like I write in my gratitude journal about like what I'm thankful for, but I also write about like what I deserve. Um, I also am a firm believer. Like I will fight for my friends till the end, and if I wouldn't say those words to a friend, I shouldn't be saying them to myself. And that's my philosophy right now. That so to in order to be kinder to myself, I tell myself like I wouldn't tell my friend they're fat or like that looks bad or something. So like I try to train my mind to think that if I wouldn't say this to a friend, I'm not gonna say it to myself. And instead I will say things like that are kinder and that are a reminder that even though I'm very introverted and non confrontational, that like speaking up is okay taking care of yourself is okay and sometimes you know you gotta put yourself first it's not selfish it's just good self-care yeah i really like that a lot um i have a little journal app kind of sort of like a little list and i put like personal reminders um so that i could see them whenever i'm interacting on my phone and i think the iPhone with some sort of like widget thing. So it's one of my widgets where I can see personal reminders to myself, like, hey, it's okay to say no to people. I don't have to always say yes. I can speak up, things like that. Um, those were all really good tips. And I hope that that helped answer that question. So another question that I saw in the chat was, how do how do we protect ourselves from the endless bad news? Um, Avina, go ahead and take it away. So this question really resonated with me because, um, you know, I have to deal with a dual identity. I'm American and I'm also Indian. Um, and right now there's just so much bad news, like local to both areas of the world. There's like a huge farmers protest going on in New Delhi. Um, like fascism is taking a huge foothold in that country as well. Um, and then we've got everything, gestures and everything happening um, in the US. So it gets extremely overwhelming, extremely fast. and. Uh, one of like the more damaging thoughts that kind of comes to my mind when I'm in this sort of spiral is like, wow, like, I don't have a place to escape to. Like, I can't be like that person who's like, you know what, I'm going back to the motherland because I wouldn't be accepted there either. And um, that gets really daunting. And I know I just voiced that, but a really important thing um, for me to do when the news does get overwhelming is to not try and, uh, I guess, make it about how much, like, my life sucks in the middle of everything. I have to step away. Um, I, you know, I practice, like I do practice meditation. Um, you know, I just kind of step back from things, focus on just my breathing. I count backwards from 10 sometimes if it's getting especially intense. Um, and I tell myself, you know what? I did enough reading for today. I'm going to rest and recharge and I'll come back to it tomorrow. And I briefly touched upon this, but I do read, like, we get 24-7 news right now because of social media being the way it is. I treat reading about current events, reading social media, like my job. Um, I'm on the clock from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and then I'm going to avoid as best as I can. I know it's important to, like, stay adrift to current uh, uh, events as much as you can. Um, but I would rather get that through more measured means. Like I'll check the Kawhi Wright Slack, for example, because sometimes someone will drop something very topical in there. And that's how I get like my little like weekend dose of information. So I try to find some sort of space like that where I'm comfortable expressing myself, where it feels like a brave space, where um, I can kind of like section away parts of my life so I can like handle the constant like fire hose of news that's like, turned on and always spraying like everywhere um so hopefully that helps i feel like i just kind of rambled a bit more than like said anything constructive but i think um similar to you know any form of self-care i think the way everyone's going to handle um the constant news cycle is a little bit different um i just encourage stepping away um, I'd like to add to that. Stepping away is definitely a good thing. And also another thing to remember, if you have to read the news constantly like me, um, is no future tripping. Don't worry about what will happen in the future. What will happen 
will happen. And worrying typically will not make your situation any better. So what I like to do is I kind of, I kind of do like Avina. I step away from the news for a little bit, or I step away for an hour if there's something I have to complete. And I kind of think to myself, I'll take things one day at a time. And if you're, if you have like a mental illness, which I understand, it's it's really something that's hard to work with. I think some days you're going to be productive and some days you're not. That's just kind of how life is. You know what I mean? It's just, it's hard, especially when you have to work with a mental illness, um, especially with like depression. And I think one of the better things to do is if you do a tiny thing, so say like you study a language, maybe study for like 10 minutes and maybe that's all you can handle for the day. The fact that you still get something done <laughs> still counts for, you know, making sure that you're okay and making sure that the news doesn't overwash you and kind of overshadow your overall goals that you want to achieve. So I think that taking one things one day at a time is probably one of the best things you can do, especially when just news just hits you like a truck every day. Like it's, it's nonstop. Yeah. Uh, social media is definitely very overwhelming. Once again, the social media breaks, you, you got to take them. I recommend them to everybody. When I'm like, things are getting too heavy, it's time to step away for like a day or two and it'll really do you some wonders. I saw another question in the chat and this person asked, what's something you've let go of in the past that helped you grow into who you are, into your current self-expression style? And then, okay. Um, I would like to go last for this question. So does someone want to kickstart answering this one? Avina, I see you smiling, and I feel like you have an answer that's like bubbling there. <laughs> I need a second to like ruminate on it as well. <laughs> yeah, I have my answer, but like I figured that someone would probably want to speak more than me at this moment. <laughs> I have a little bit of a, I don't know if this one really counts, but something that I had to let go when it comes to, uh, J fashion in general is the idea that you I have to like get a certain dress or fit like body image body image is basically what I'm trying to say um I had dresses that were uncomfortable I could fit them but like at what cost basically <laughs> um so letting go of the idea of just needing a dress or just because it's cute I wanted to have it uh to finding more comfortable dresses in general. Like I started off Lolita getting what I could get and making myself kind of fit into a lot of different blouses and skirts and things like that. Um, but over the years, very quickly, and that's also very much thanks to my community, I was just like, oh, sharing is a thing. And there's so many dresses that are beyond comfortable. Um, there's so many blouses. They're like the crop top mesh ones that are perfect. Like instead of having to worry about the button issue when you're or quite busty and things like that, uh, just finding something that's suitable and liking it. Like there's no point of getting it because, oh, I, you know, you didn't think you're going to look cute, but like find one that you like. I have them in all the colors, pinks and whites and reds and I like it and now I like how I look and the dresses that I have, it may not be the most popular ones, um, but the dresses still work. I'm still in the fashion, I'm still killing it. And <laughs> I'm gonna keep doing that and I'm not wearing, I, I know my measurement. So that's one thing that's helpful, um, be mindful of it, but not getting so obsessed with your body image of having to fit into something. Um, just to wear the fashion because there's definitely dresses out there that are accommodating and there's just so many more resources than when I first started for getting dresses that will uh, also help you look cute. Did you get your thoughts together yet, Ivina? Are you ready? <laughs> I, I think I'm ready. So th this kind of goes back to the last piece I'd written um, for Kawhi Riot. Um, where for, for me, it was kind of realizing that I could make more friends and other kinds of friends. Um, I was kind of surrounded by a lot of people who spent a lot of time on like the darker corners of the internet, they shall not be named, but uh, it led to them, you know, kind of filling me in uh, when someone said something really horrendously racist about me. <laughs> and I was just like, I, you know, this, this isn't helpful like these these are random people on the internet who like don't have 
the courage to actually say it to my face. Um, I don't need to hear about all these people kind of in the background. Um, it, so, you know, marking that boundary, telling people like, don't, don't bring this stuff up with me. I, I don't want to hear it. It's not constructive. It's not helpful. It just kind of frightens me. And, um, that, that helped me kind of realign myself and like be even braver and more outlandish with the things I wear because um, I don't have a lot of older photos of me up online anywhere but you can see that there was definitely this middle period where I was playing it very safe and it was a time when I was constantly like living in fear of just like having someone say something really really awful to me um, when in the long run all I need to do was to either tell those friends like cut it out stop mentioning these things to me or even just cut out the friends who were the ones actively doing it to me um so that's like so letting go of like a particular friend circle finding a great support system in college that like helped me kind of get out of that um ha like you can see how my style like changed the moment i started to be like surrounded by healthy relationships um so recognizing when there might be a relationship that isn't helpful, that's only causing you stress, um, and making the really, really difficult step of just saying like, hey, um, I don't think this is working out for either of us anymore. Like, we both are bringing different things to the table. Um, I, I think like taking that step can really help um, your personal style too, because you just feel so much better day to day. Um, I'd like to add something about um... <laughs> fashion for me and what I had to let go of. So for me, I did have to let go of like wanting everyone to like me because when I was younger, I definitely was a people pleaser and like, please like me. And I realized that's kind of not how life works and that, you know, I have this one life, so I may as well live it in the best way that I possibly can because whatever, people are going to dislike what I do, whether it's they like it or not. It's people are going to dislike you um, regardless. So with that in mind, um, I stopped caring that so much when I got into university and things got better. Uh, although there were definitely people who raised their eyebrows and were like, what are you wearing? Um, <laughs> and they were definitely freaked out by the fact that I wore giant bows and dresses to class sometimes because, or I would be in Miami Kauai fashion and have like red around my eyes, it'd be crazy. Um, and I think the fact that the LA fashion community down there, at least the people that I got to meet, um, were very great. Like I, and modeling down there, um, really kind of boosted my confidence for me to be able to continue on in the fashion that I was in, but also to explore different fashions. And I will forever be grateful for that. And, you know, all my professors who did like my fashion, they definitely told me to believe in myself. Okay. They didn't really say that, but. I just had to have one more pun before I sign off. Yeah, um, so something that I like, oh, there are two things, actually. One is perfectionism. So being one of those uh, those GT kids, the gifted and talented, if I wasn't good at doing it, I would have the, I guess, the habit of quitting it really early on. And with alternative fashion, I found that letting go of being perfect in the style has really helped me, like, tremendously. And... Going forward, I hope that I can encourage more people to like stop trying to strive to be perfect. Just just be you, just exist, and that's good enough. And accepting that I think is really important. The other thing is, because I got a little radicalized in college, guys, I let go of that uh, the desire for the proximity to whiteness. So <laughs> letting go of that really does a, a really a really good thing for a person of color like myself. So once I let go of that and I found more acceptance of myself, of who I identify as and like everything about my heritage and my history, it does wonders. It really, it doesn't clear your skin. Cause like, obviously I still have skin issues, but like, you know, it, metaphorically it clears your skin. You start glowing once you start like finding that personal acceptance and finding community is really important too. So that helped a lot. Um, I don't think I saw any other questions. Um, I want if to kind of add real quickly that it is so important to decolonize your fashion. Like, yes. Like, yes. <laughs> that was another good piece that you wrote as well. That was one of my favorites. So I'm just like, we don't have to be, we don't have to be Eurocentric. We can be ourselves and that, that is enough. That is good enough. Our existence is important. But yeah. Anyway, guys. So any last questions, comments, concerns? If not, 
We've got a minute left, so I'm putting up our socials. One yeah, time. come come get to know us, see our journeys in real time. And of course, Koi Riot is a platform that you can get involved in. And if you feel comfortable enough, brave enough to share your personal journey, we do welcome that. Um, we do take submissions and pitches and things like that. But otherwise, this has been a really great panel of, you know, like this was, this was like intimate in a good way. <laughs> like it's very like wholesome and very uplifting. This panel almost like I, I wanted it to be a form of self care for all of us where we get to get some stuff off our chest, kind of talk it out. Um, hopefully, it, like everyone else got that same sort of vibe, got that same sort of uh, um, takeaway from it. Uh, but yeah, that was my hope. Yeah, and thank you guys for coming through. Um, I saw someone in that article. If you could just shoot Kawhi Riot a message on Instagram or Facebook, we'll definitely link you the article right away. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and just wanted to end it on this note. Finding joy is a radical act, especially in trying times. The fact that we are finding joy, that we're happy and content and like and loving ourselves is something that society would hate to see us do so being being this way is radical being this way is just so important for all of us and i want to encourage you to find that joy 